you have to admit that these are strange happenings in a culture supposedly driven by a patriarchy that favors and advantages men at the expense of women. The allowance of all this, the enabling of it, is modern chivalry. And it does not matter whether it's a product of feminist ideology or a miscalled sense of traditional values. Its gynocentric origins are precisely the same. To understand how this happened, we must trace this brand of chivalry and the deification of women back to its roots. Not to Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, or other second wave icons. Not even to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and others of the first wave. Oh, incidentally, if you'll pardon a slight personal departure here, during my research for this talk, I discovered a first wave feminist from Sussex, the same area where I've traced back my family name to the 1500s. Wikipedia describes this woman as a militant suffragette, feminist, and fascist who was in prison three times for terroristic acts in Her Majesty's Prison Holloway in this very city. Here's a picture of her. Her name was Nora Elam. Now, I haven't managed the courage yet to investigate a family connection with certainty, but just in case, I wanted to say here on UK soil that whatever this Harridan did, I'm happy to be a part of the movement to undo it. But enough of my history. It's our history that matters, in particular the evolution of gynocentric chivalry. Originally, chivalry was a different concept than we know it today. It was a military code of conduct upheld by the nobility and used to ensure the protection of serfs who lived and worked on their lands, and more than a few times to keep them in line. It also served well to keep men already inclined to take risk and act protectively to act in the service of the church, the king, and the aristocracy. That military chivalry was the cornerstone for feudalism. It ensured that arms would be drawn and blood spilled by vassals on command. Those who did not abide by that code or who performed poorly in their efforts were saddled with the same type of shame and disgrace we use on men today who fail as the protectors of and providers for women. Military chivalry was a tradition rooted in the bloody realities of medieval life, but it was not a romantic notion, far from it. So how did chivalry go from being a military code to being a codified standard for men to meet in their protective treatment of women? The answer to that is a matter of historical record. It was through manipulation of the gynocentric instinct. In the 12th century, Eleanor of Aquitaine and her daughter Marie de Champagne engaged in an intensive program to popularize the idea of courtly or romantic love. By definition, this brand of love was adulterous in nature and it was given value that rose above all other morality. Even, as we saw in the story of Lancelot and Guinevere, above the authority and power of a king. Keep in mind that at the time and reaching back through recorded history, people generally held two notions of love and both were highly impersonal. There was lust, a purely physical but largely impersonal form of love, and there was what we call agape, an elevated love, as in the love of God or the love of mankind, a sweeping spiritual form of love but not a personal one. People recognized what we call infatuation, of course, but it was not viewed as love. It was seen more like a vexation or mental affliction, a kind of craziness that only led to ruin. I suppose in some ways that they were smarter then than we are now. At the time, marriages were arranged, as they still are in parts of the East. Marriage was the way that families furthered their interest, both politically and financially. Husbands and wives often grew quite fond of each other over time, but they did not enter matrimony out of a desperate emotional need to be with each other. Eleanor, a woman of serious means and influence, sort of like a supersized Betty Friedan of the high Middle Ages, 
saw an opportunity in this to promote a connection between men and women inspired by passion and infatuation and driven by a model of service, particularly of service to women. She and her daughter commissioned troubadours who borrowed from the ethics of military chivalry to write books and songs that carried this message to all the European courts. Even though the message was meant primarily for the aristocracy, it eventually filtered down into the general population and quickly grew in popularity till the arranged marriage in the West became a thing of the past and till the view of women as emotional toddlers in need of male guardianship and enabling became a thing of the future. This was not the first time that the social paradigm drastically shifted because of the actions of nobility. The Emperor Constantine of Rome sparked the exponential growth of a small religious sect with a series of edicts. Today we know that sect as Christianity. The Indian king Ashoka single-handedly had the same effect on Buddhism. In both these cases, the actions of single, powerful people changed the way people thought and what they believed in the most radical and permanent ways. And so Eleanor and Marie arguably furthered an even more powerful change. Matrimony, notice it is not patrimony, is a word that originally meant it was time for a woman to set aside childish desires and to be ready for the responsibilities of motherhood. That was the standard and the expectations prior to the gynocentric model furthered by Eleanor and Marie. Their advocacy was a rebellion against the arrangement tradition. It was an amazingly effective campaign that now shapes the lives of everyone. The advent of romantic chivalrous love took the naturally occurring tendency in men to take care of women and made the first great leap toward a gynocentric society that would tolerate and indeed encourage all manner of insanity in the name of putting women first. 